You're listening to The Stressless Life with Dr. Yip, a podcast about conquering your fears and overcoming anxiety. I'm your host, Noah Laracy. Let's say hello to Dr. Yip. Hello, Noah. Dr. Yip is a licensed psychologist who's board certified in behavioral and cognitive therapy and an expert in the treatment of anxiety and OCD. And today we're recording from San Francisco where we're attending IOCDF or the Conference for the International OCD Foundation. And we are very excited to have Dr. Jonathan Grayson as our special guest. Hi there. John Grayson is the director of the Grayson LA Treatment Center for Anxiety and OCD in Pasadena, California. He is a nationally recognized expert who has worked with OCD sufferers for more than three decades. He is also the author of a classic in the field, Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, a personalized recovery program for living with uncertainty. So, Dr. Grayson, you've sort of made your career on this idea of uncertainty. Can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by it? Well, I think the basic idea is very simple. There is truly nothing in life that is certain. In fact, research has shown us that the only people who are certain are stupid. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and with OCD, they tend to have three traits that we cannot get rid of. First, they tend to be above average intelligence. They lack the critical stupidity to be certain. The core of the problem for them is that they are trying to be 100% certain in the area that they're concerned about. So for non-OC problems, they treat it like everybody else. They pretend that they're certain. I mean, for instance, right now, do you have anybody that you love, Noah? Yes. Who? My daughter. And is she alive? She is. And how do you know? I talked to her a couple hours ago. So she could be dead. (laughs) That's horrible. (laughs) It is a a remote possibility. It is a possibility. And despite the fact that that is true, you actually don't feel uncertain. Your brilliant plan for handling this is you're going to pretend that she's alive because you actually don't know. And you're going to deal with it if you get a horrible phone call. And I feel like neither of you, and I just want to check this out, want to get maimed, paralyzed, or disfigured. I don't that's a very good idea no me neither okay and um i know you both live in la so you do a little bit of driving a lot of driving so you risk some idiot ramming your car and doing that to you and again your brilliant plan is i'm gonna wait till i'm crushed under the metal to deal with it so sufferers like you for non-oc problems they handle uncertainty that way they're just gonna wait for it to happen but for the area in which they have their concern they want to know right now definitely And the trouble is they're too smart to know right now because for every logical answer, there is a what if. So the goal of treatment, because again, biologically, what we know about OCD, they actually are more insensitive to uncertainty. It takes less uncertainty for them to feel more anxious. That's the biological part. The learned part is what is the focus of the problem? Do they have a problem with hand washing? Do they have a problem that maybe I'm going to kill somebody? I mean, I don't really want to kill somebody, but if I don't want to kill somebody, why would I be thinking about killing somebody? Maybe I really do want to kill somebody, even though I'm just thinking about it because I don't really want to do that. And how can I actually ever prove that? Are you suggesting that we all walk around with the idea that anything can happen at any time? So I should be thinking that my sons are dead. Horrible thought. It would be useful, because I don't think there's anything you should do unless you like to shit all over yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it'd be useful to recognize that that's a possibility. And, you know, your sons are very young right now, so it seems to you a silly thought. But... You're going to have these 17-year-old sons who are going to be out on a date. Despite all the technology you will have to track them, they will have found a way to disable it. And they will be supposed to be home at X time, and it's going to be an hour and a half later. And in a statistical way, you will know that they are probably not doing anything horribly depraved. They probably are not being killed. They're going to come home late. You're going to have to kill them. (laughs) But at that moment, The idea that this is probably true and they might be dead, you're not going to quite be so calm. So yes, you actually at that moment would have to consider like, okay, they're hopefully okay, but this could be the night. Because the more you say to yourself, no, this can't be it, the more crazy you will be feeling and the more they will suffer when they come home. Well, it's a good thing I have 17 years to wait for this. Yes. (laughs) What do you say to a patient that comes to you and they just say, I I can't live in a world, right, where that's a possibility. I need to have some sense of certainty to go on. So I refuse to believe this. What do you say? You know, I actually had a client come to me. He was seeing another therapist. His problem was he didn't like the idea that he or his family could die at any time. And the therapist was seeming to do all the right exposures. They were imagining his family dying and trying to cope with it. And he wasn't getting better. So I said to him, do you accept the goal of treatment? And he responded to me, I I don't know, I think so. Like, what is it? 
I said, the goal is for you to be happy in a world where you and your family can die at any time. I don't want that. And I said, okay, what's the alternative? And he laughed, right? Because there is no other world. And I said, this is great. Now we know why you weren't responding to treatment. Because although you were going through the steps of treatment, you had some other goal in mind. So it's not like you have some horrid, awful case of OCD that's untreatable or there's something really defective about you that you're untreatable. You just simply were going for the wrong goal. So generally with clients, we'll discuss certainty and the possibility of being certain. Again, people with OCD are really smart, bright people. So one of the compelling things about this argument is no matter how much they hate it, they acknowledge that there's some truth to it. Now, that doesn't always work out. Because in the case of this young man, he did something very sad. He refused to take that goal. So he stayed sick. So at some point in treatment, I would say to somebody, if your goal is to be absolutely certain, there is no hope. And often in the course of treatment, if they have trouble with that goal, we don't throw them out. Treatment then becomes focused on working on just accepting that goal and helping them to agree that this is their only path to freedom. You know, I, I will point out to them that they have done a tremendous, incredible job of doing the empirical experiment of trying to get absolute certainty. And the results suck. It's really an issue for everybody in the world. There yes. is no certainty. Now, the thing is that non-sufferers, although I don't think they handle uncertainty well on the average, yes, they don't do as badly as sufferers of OCD. On the other hand, when somebody with OCD conquers the problem and learns how to live with OCD, they're not normal. They're better than normal because they're actually coping with uncertainty, which is not what the normal population, so-called normal population does. To accept uncertainty is, you know, the term acceptance is funny because, you know, in our Western society, acceptance is like, oh, it's going to be like, you know, running through fields of daisies and really great and happy. But, you know, the idea that you have to accept something means that it's something bad that you don't like. And you're stuck in this battle between, I don't want that. I don't want that. But as long as you're fighting that, you're frantic. But when you come to acceptance, the initial response is depression. It's like, oh, Denial. I'm stuck with that. And I'm stuck living in a world where there's uncertainty. Now, I think the way we present this to them, it's not like, okay, yep, sorry, your life's going to be terrible now that you have to live with uncertainty. We talk about all they've lost to OCD, all the things they will be able to have if they will learn to live in the present and learn to accept uncertainty, but they're going to have to learn. It will be painful. It's probably as painful as having OCD with just one minor difference. Having OCD is endless suffering and, you know, working towards fighting it has an end to suffering. So in terms of your question, in case you forgot what it was, you were asking me, was it probabilities? And people with OCD, when they talk about probabilities, they're cheating. That is, when they say low probability, they keep trying to say no probability. So they get caught in a loop, low probability, low probability, but what if it's the exception? Low probability, but what if it's the exception? And you can always tell when you have an OC problem because if you say to them, okay, this is a low probability, but it might happen. They never want you to end on, but it might happen sentence. And that's the one you have to end on too. To accept uncertainty is not only to accept that a terrible thing might happen, but then you have this other very difficult thing to do which is if it were to happen, no matter how horrible, what would you do to try to make the best of it? And I'm serious. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you have killed your children, whether you're dying of cancer, whatever it is, how would you accept it? Again, you know, we think of a real life situation where somebody gets a diagnosis of cancer in which they are going to die. Obviously, the person is not going to be happy. But the question is, in your last year, do you want to try to make the best of it? Or do you want the last year to be extra horrible? It may be really hard, but I hope I would be brave enough to try to make the best of it. The good news with OCD is generally, although we're asking them to cope with the possibility, it very well may be something that's low probability. So they're coping with something that they may not have to deal with. So this concept of uncertainty and accepting uncertainty pretty much applies not to just OCD. Am I getting that right? My personal belief would be there is nothing that is certain, you know, the thing about certainty is people talk about it like we're talking about a fact. Certainty is actually an emotion. It's an emotion that correlates with reality. You know, so you think your kids are alive, probably alive. You actually think there are no terrorists outside the hotel door, probably not. So every moment of the day, without realizing it, your feeling of certainty gets reinforced so that you begin to make the mistake that this emotion 
is truth. Of course, that's why we get so upset when it gets violated, because it turns out. And the feeling, I mean, it's a nice feeling. You know, like, I feel like I love my wife. I feel sure I love my wife. Now, you notice I say, I feel sure, because like, ask me to prove it. And, you know, whatever I keep saying, and you'll go, yes, but what about this? And what about that? And if I was a person who never thought about this, I would at some point say, I just know. I just know is code for somebody who doesn't have OCD, who's quote unquote normal. That's code for, I really have no idea. Shut up. Just leave me alone. That's the way I feel. But, you know, I get along with my life. We have a great relationship. So I have no reason to question it so I can let myself feel it. But the feeling is just that in this country, presumably when you get married, unless you're psycho, you expect your marriage to last forever. Great, you have that feeling, you feel certain. And we know that for 50% of the people, they're wrong. So this thing that people with OCD are sacrificing their life for, it's not like it proves anything. So are you saying that this desire for certainty is a fantasy or an illusion? What is it? I think, you know, in an evolutionary way, kind of primitive man, the desire for certainty is kind of the what's that? You know, primitive man walking in the jungle, hears a noise, turns around. It's good to like find out what's behind you. It has an evolutionary use, but it also can be useless. It would be hard to find somebody who doesn't want certainty in areas. I mean, there are areas we actually love uncertainty with. You know, presumably you like to watch new movies as opposed to just rewatch the same movie over and over again. Yes. Right. So we all like a certain level of uncertainty or, you know, we don't want to do the Groundhog's Day version of this where every day we're going to meet and have the same interview again. The exciting part is like, is it different? Are there particular types of OCD that you find more difficult to treat than others? And if so, what are they? You know, I've been working with OCD since 1979 and, and I really love working with it because I think that, you know, on one hand at the core... It's all the same. But on the other hand, every manifestation has its own separate argument. And uh, I, I really enjoy the exercise of working on them all. I think among the harder ones are the ones where, for lack of a better words, where the obsession is obsessing about obsessing. You know, so these are people where the content of the obsession is not that important. You know, it's like, I don't really care. You know, it's like, I'm worried that fire might break out if I don't check the alarm system or something, but I'm not really worried about the fire. What I don't like the fact is I keep obsessing. I, I, I kind of almost know there's not a fire. I don't want that thought. Or I have this picture stuck in my head. Or I have tinnitus. Now, you know, I happen to not care. I have tinnitus. There are people, they want the tinnitus to stop. So in those things, when I'm obsessing about obsessing, it's the only obsession where the feared consequence comes true, right? Generally, you know, if I have contamination, people don't die of AIDS, I don't kill my family, all these things don't happen. But for these obsessing about obsessing, my fear is that while I'm doing this, life is horrible. And actually, life is horrible. So it feels really difficult for them. So it's a it's, it's um, a little bit more challenged to help them get to the point of understanding why it's going to be okay to allow those things to be there. Because initially, if you say to somebody, we're going to help you live with those things, their feeling is, oh, you're just telling me I'm stuck with it, which is not what we're telling them, but we have to help get them over that and to understand why that's a doable treatment that will actually make them feel better. So if we are applying the topic of uncertainty and, us and accepting uncertainty, how would a person go about accepting that they have obsessions? I mean, if the problem is they don't want the obsessions or they don't want to hear a sound mm -hmm. or something? Yes. Well, I mean, we have a set of questions we would ask them. Usually we'll start with, imagine that you're being hit full force with your obsession so that you're really upset. You know, it's just banging you and you're really bouncing off the walls. And imagine that for some magic reason, we know that in 10 minutes, it's going to be gone. That's it. Never bother you again. And for some reason, you believe this because it's going to be true. How would you be? And most people will kind of say, oh, well, I'd be okay then. And, you know, I can point out, well, that's really interesting if you think about it, because during that first 10 minutes, it's the same as if it's going to be for 10 minutes or for 10 hours. And although you're saying, well, I can put up with it for 10 minutes, I mean, it's still just a cognitive thought, because I feel really confident that if I subject you to the most unimaginable physical torture I can come up with, and I'm, I am unfortunately really imaginative, <laughs> that 10 minutes may be better than 10 hours, but I don't think it will be tolerable. And, and I'll also ask that if you have a loved one who dies two weeks in, from now, I'll, I'll just ask you, Noah, two weeks from now, if your daughter dies, you have a daughter, right? That I remember yep. that. Yeah. So if she dies two weeks from now, will thoughts of her be popping in your head? Yes. And will they be upsetting thoughts? Yes. And will it interfere with what you're doing? Yes. Is that an obsession? No. 
Why not? Yes, you're obsessing, but it, it wouldn't necessarily be clinical in that sense. It's normal. It's, it's understandable in that context that you'd be obsessing. Possible that you would be obsessing. Most people would say no, and both of you seem to be implying no, but you're just worried that I'm going to trap you somehow. <laughs> which, which you probably will. But you're already, it's okay, you've already fallen into it. Um, <laughs> Because those, those two examples, the 10-minute example and this, the exact same thing is happening. The information, the context of the situation has allowed you to make a decision and you don't realize you're doing that. And that decision changes it from an obsession to something you can cope with. And that decision is very simple. I'm going to let it be there. In the case of the loss of your daughter, I mean, you obviously are going to be horribly miserable, but you're not going to say, I don't want to think of her. That's just terrible. It's too painful to think about her. You allow it to be there. In the case of the 10 minutes, it's like, oh, I'll let it be there. I remember right after 9-11, I had a support group and I asked the question of that. How many of you are, it was one week later. How many of you think about 9-11? How many are popping your head? Blah, blah, blah. You know, how many of you consider an obsession? And in the group, everyone said it's not an obsession except for one guy. And what did he do different? I don't want to think about it. I can't send the idea. And he went through all the things he didn't want to think about 9-11. Now, one week after 9-11, good luck not thinking about it since it was everywhere. So what we're going to try to help the person do is get in what, for lack of better words, I'm going to call the 10-minute frame of mind. That is not that they think it's going to end in 10 minutes, but they were willing to tolerate it. It's still there, but somehow it wasn't as bad. Kind of like if we imagine two people with a headache. One has a headache, one has a headache, and they are hypochondriacal and think they have brain cancer. Same headache, and the hypochondriacal guy is really anxious and bouncing off the walls. If we help him overcome his hypochondriasis, well, the headache still hurts, but it's not as bad. He can function. So we want to help the person to be able to basically live with that. Now, obviously, it's work. If it was just a decision, I would be really smart. And everybody would see me for five minutes and they'd be cured. But this at least allows them to make the decision. I want to go through this process to figure out how I can learn to do this. So it's just letting the obsession be. You say just letting, and I feel like that's just would be wonderfully simple. I'm saying that to begin treatment, they would just have to decide that they would like to go through this learning process. You know, it's kind of like coming to this conference, I had to decide to come here, but then I had to make this journey to get here. Now, that decision didn't get me here. I had to do the journey. The odds of me ending up in this room at this conference talking to you without having made that decision, possible but really unlikely. So I guess if we're going to talk about just, yes, they have to decide that they're willing to do this so they can begin the journey. But the journey is still a pain in the neck and a lot of work. I really love your example in your book of the gamblers. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how you came up with that. You're referring to the fact that I've often asked people with OCD, do they like to gamble? And for the most part, they say no. And I say, oh, uh, no offense, but you're a liar. And, and, you know, they kind of look at me because everybody knows that when you're in front of a slot machine, you're going to lose, right? I mean, they're in the casinos. It's there to take your money. But, you know, when you play them and you think about, like, all the money that I might win, you know, so it's kind of cool. And you put your money in. I hate they got rid of the lever. I loved pulling the lever, even though it was fake. But press the button, and you watch it all spin, and, and you're actually shocked that you lost, even though you knew that was most likely to happen. And if you're a problem gambler, well, you know, every now and then you win. You get a little bit. You never get the jackpot. Never net it get enough. And in the end, you lose everything. And so when somebody is sitting there confronted with an OCD urge, and it's like, the feeling is, I'm going to suffer and be tortured all day. But if I do this ritual and just get it right, I'll be free. Now, if I get them not in that moment and say, hey, if you start ritualizing, what's going to happen? And they can tell me, oh, I'm going to get stuck. Or they might say, oh, sometimes it works. And then I can ask how often does it work? And it's like, not much. So again, it's like I won five bucks at the slot machine and spend a thousand. So they're gamblers because at that moment, maybe I will be free. And so to help person to give up on trying to pursue that since it's a loss. And have you had patients where they would come in and uh, they would ask you to guarantee that by doing exposures, that's the treatment, would work? What would you tell them? I actually have had that happen. I actually came up at our support group the other night and I would tell them, here are your two choices. What you do does not work. This is your best shot. I can't guarantee it, but this is your best shot. If you hold back during treatment, 
highly likely to fail. So yes, you would have to throw yourself fully into it. So your decision is to choose to live the way you are forever or to take a chance at getting better where the odds are pretty good, but no, it's not a 100% guarantee. And so I hope most of the time I can talk them into it as opposed to that one young man who decided, nope, he did not want to learn how to live with uncertainty. Wouldn't it be useful for all of us to learn how to live with uncertainty? It sound, definitely sounds like it's a, a wise way to live, right? Well, that's why I, you know, I said earlier, I think if you overcome OCD, if you learn to cope with it, you are better than normal because there are so many people who don't cope with uncertainties very well. And I think ultimately that gets to them. I think a lot of people will use denial. And I think the thing about having OCD, so I think, I think, you know, if we talk about non-sufferers, they get to fall in three categories I'm making up. They're suffering a lot because of they can't stand the way life is. They're really good at denial or they're that select few that copes with uncertainty. OCD, we knock out the denial group. OCD people, they don't get to do denial. They get to be in heaven or hell. Okay. You know, they're, they're suffering, trying to be certain. And again, they're just not dumb enough to be certain. Mm -hmm. Just as an aside, OCD sufferers make terrible cult followers because cult followers have to not ask questions. So yes, I think I think they, you know, it, it, it is useful for everybody because as near as I can tell, that's the truth of the world. Before we go here, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history with IOCDF and how you came to be involved? Oh my God. <laughs> Here's a long story. <laughs> In the very beginning, <laughs> there, there was a foundation and they had no affiliates. Uh, and I, I was involved with the foundation, not at the beginning, but pretty soon. And we actually, they were in Yale at that point, near Yale. And uh, we actually went to them and said, we want to be an affiliate. And it was so early in their history. It's like, huh, we don't know how to have an affiliate yet. But so we were, but, you know, we connected with them then. So I, I might be the only person who does this, but... I don't think I get anything for it. I have been to every OCD conference and I'm not sure that anyone else currently holds that record for whatever it's worth. Um, so, so I've been in there in the beginning and been one of the people kind of helping it grow and being very involved with it. Tell the audience a little bit about the walk you do every year or maybe how it went this year. Every year we do a walk that we used to call virtual camping. We've now renamed it, or they did, but I think it's a better name than I had, which is the Road to Recovery Tour. It's based on uh, 1982. I had taken uh, a number of people with OCD on an actual camping trip where, you know, every day we did lots of exposure. And, you know, when they would get there on Friday night, new people will always have this fear of like, I've made a big mistake. What am I doing here? And I always tell them, you're going to keep feeling that way. And we'll have a support group tonight and that'll feel good but then you'll go back to wondering what you do here in the you know in the morning what we're going to do is we're going to wake up early we're going to rub our hands in the dirt we're going to go to the latrine rub our hands in the latrine i'm then going to pour kerosene on your hands because it says don't do that and then you're going to cut the potatoes and onions for breakfast and make the sandwiches for lunch and um and when I tell people this at this point, they're not really feeling comforted for some reason. I'm then, feeling grossed out by that right now. And then, <laughs> and we, we work on more than contamination, but you know, then we're going to go on a really difficult hike. We're going to either be going up this really steep hill where we'll need ropes, or if it's a little rainy, we're going to be going through a swamp that it will take us about a half hour to go every 50 feet. And during this walk, magic will occur and you will be glad that you're here. Now, upon description, nobody really seems to believe me. And I remember one young woman who had BDD uh, and it was raining the night she came. So she was really miserable because it focused on her hair. And I remember when we came out of the swamp because she screamed, I'm having a great time. <laughs> and um, the magic happened. And on Sunday, when it's time to leave, we would have a support group and everybody would be sad because somehow like this magic freedom where they just felt so good was ending. So the support group person who actually talked me into having the camping trip, one year talked me into having the virtual camping trip at the convention. Because I initially told her, there's no way we can do this at a convention. But she talked me into it and now it's an institution where I will take, and this year there were somewhere between 200 and 300 people out through the city and their families, sufferers and professionals where people are encouraged to everybody to do the exposures, but they don't necessarily have to. So, you know, we'll be playing with dumpsters. I find somebody who's homeless and say, I'm teaching people about charity. Would you take a quarter from each of them and shake hands? And for people with harm OCD, I give out knives and we walk through a gauntlet of people. We sneak into a parking lot for people who worry that maybe their actions will cause harm and kick car tires in case we'll cause a flat tire and somebody will die later because of it. So we do a number of things like that. And it's uh, about a two hour trip. And, you know, it's, it's always hard to describe something like this. Imagine describing 
describing your favorite movie to somebody in six sentences. <laughs> you can give the plot, but like they don't really get the feel of the movie, you know? And so, you know, if it's not their kind of movie, it's like, ah. So this is a transformative experience. People, first of all, people do stuff that they would never believe they could do. And actually for many of them, it's easier than they would have thought. And so for a lot of people, I mean, first of all, we've had seen people make some permanent gains. Somebody gets better from two hours, but literally they will talk about the next year, things that they held on to that from trip. And for so many people, it becomes hope. Like they see what they could do. So they believe now that they can do treatment. So they will move on. So it is something crazily fun about leading 200 to 300 people doing horrible things throughout the city. And, uh, and I do think part of the reason that it works is, uh, that adolescent impulse in me for sure, mm -hmm. but apparently locked away in everybody to kind of be bad. This seems to unleash you because generally we start by blocking traffic because, you know, it takes a long time to cross the street and it seems to infect everybody with a healthy rebellion. That sounds like fun. Well, I want to thank you so much for all of the good work you do, all the people that you help, and all of the planning that's involved. Can't even imagine all the <laughs> responsibilities that you have. And you. Uh, I really, really, really appreciate you donating your time and uh, helping some of the audience out there who's listening right now about how to accept uncertainty. And that is a goal if they want to get better. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Stressless Life Podcast. You can join the discussion and find more information at thestresslesslifepodcast.com. Please write to us with questions and comments at podcast at thestresslesslife.com. Until next time, stay stressless.